Well, hello there, Mountain View Baptist Church kids, and a special hello to all of you truth seekers out there that have joined us. Thank you for joining us once again for our second week of our virtual Bible school. And we have a lot of exciting things planned for you today. I sure hope that you got to watch the adventure last week. And we've got another exciting adventure we're going on today. But before we get started, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for loving us. We do thank you for the truth that you've given us through your word to help us understand more about creation and all those events that have happened uh, in the past. And Lord, I do pray that you will give us uh, ears to hear what you have for our hearts to learn today. We love you, Lord. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, as you can see, we are in our VBS headquarters, and each week we have five different stations that we will be going to, and we'll be learning different things each week in those stations, and we're going to go ahead and go to our first station for today. That is the research station. Now, what happened last week at the research station? Well, we were able to learn about creation, and I sure hope that you enjoyed that. I sure did, learning about what how God has created everything everything. We do not believe in this thing that many schools teach um, called evolution. Matter of fact, there are many things that scientists have learned that proves that evolution could not have just happened. And we believe that God created this world about 6,000 years ago. Now evolutionists believe that the world is millions, uh, some even believe billions of years old. And there are many things that prove that it couldn't be millions of years old. And last week we learned about one of the things that evolutionists use is called radiometric dating. Uh, which is a, something they do where they scan the rocks and they look for different minerals in the rock and they believe that tells them how old the rock is. And last week we learned that that is not very reliable. Now why is radiometric dating not very reliable? Well because um, when they have scanned things they've seen all kinds of different crazy ages in, uh, in these things that they scan. And there's a lot of assumptions that they have to make when they're doing these scans. For example, last week the, the uh, VBS kids learned that they had scanned rocks that they knew were only formed about 200 years ago from a volcano, but the radiometric dating said they were over 6 million years old. You want me to give you another quick example here? Well, they uh, several years ago they used radiometric dating on a snail. The snail was alive. Now, snails don't live very long, but they did radiometric dating on this snail, and guess how old they said the snail was? Well, they said this snail could be anywhere from 2,300 years old to 27,000 years old. My, that is a crazy old snail there if he's really that old. But it's just one of those things that prove that radiometric dating does not really tell us how old the world is. So we're going to be going to a, another station or another um, uh, fact that we're going to learn today about creation. Now remember, everything we learn is focused around the Bible. The Bible should be the center of everything we learn. God's Word is the center. And we want to be sure that we're looking at science and, and the uh, beginning of time through the Bible. We want to use those correct lenses that we learned about last week. So, and remember, we've got just different things we're going to be learning about here each week. Uh, you can see some of them, they're hidden behind those leaves there. And, oh my, there's that scary one again. I wonder what that's going to be about, but that's not what we're learning about this week. This week, we're going to be learning about a true event that happened that many people who teach evolution don't believe it happened. What do you think we're going to learn about looking at that picture there? If you guessed the flood, you are correct. Now, there are many people who do not believe in God, who do not believe that there was a worldwide flood, even though there is evidence all around the world about this worldwide flood. And they try to prove that it didn't happen. Now, why are they trying to prove that? Well, I've got something I want you to read here. It says, if I can convince you that the flood was not real, then I can convince you that heaven and hell are not real. And 
the uh, people that don't believe in God, uh, and many of them are just tricked by the devil, want to try to trick us into believing that there was not a worldwide flood. Because if they can prove that, which they can't, then they'll, that'll make us think, well, what is, is heaven and hell a real place? Is the Bible true? Well, the Bible is true. And there are many things that prove that there was a worldwide flood. And we're going to have the VBS kids come in here in just a second, and they're going somewhere very special today. Somebody up in Kentucky by the name of Ken Ham, who is a scientist who believes in creation, has uh, built a life-size ark. And the VBS kids got to visit that life-size ark, and they were able to learn some things that um, many questions that we have about the ark, they were able to learn those answers. So we're going to join the VBS kids right now, and then we have a special video from our friends at Answers in Genesis that, that help us to realize, hey, there really was a worldwide flood. Hit it, VBS kids. Abigail, we've been looking everywhere. Where is the secret of creation? I don't know. Whoa, what's that? It's the art. Maybe we can find the secret in there. Where's the entrance? It's all the way up there. No, it's over there. We have to go up the ramp. Now this one I've heard quite a bit. The fossil record speaks for itself and it proves evolution. Really. Well first of all, evidence like the fossil record doesn't speak for itself. It's interpreted through a person's worldview, like looking through a lens. We all have the same evidence in the present, the same rock layers, the same fossils, etc. And we interpret this evidence in regard to the past through the lens or worldview we use. An evolutionist will interpret the evidence through the lens of what he's been taught about evolution in millions of years, but a biblical creationist will interpret the same fossils differently through the lens of the Bible. Now both are looking at the same evidence in the present, 
but both are interpreting it very differently. So looking at the fossil record in the present, because that's all we have, and interpreting it through the lens of God's word, we find that what we actually observe in the present confirms the interpretation obtained by looking through the lens of the Bible. Now, the only meaningful place to start is with the word of someone who has seen everything from the beginning and told us exactly what happened. That someone is God, who has given us a written account of the world's true history in the Bible. Genesis 1-1 says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now, God's written word tells us that during creation week, God created different kinds of animals and plants according to their kinds. The implication is that they will produce after their kind. That's exactly what we see today, isn't it? An elephant produces an elephant, a dog produces a dog, and on and on. Now on the sixth day, man and woman, Adam and Eve, were also created and God declared everything very good. It was complete and perfect, and there was no death because there was no sin. Later on in Genesis chapter 3, it is revealed that the man and woman being tempted by the serpent rebelled against God, broke his command, and sin and corruption entered the world. In fact, the entire creation was altered and is no longer in its originally perfect, very good state. People and animals began to die. But could gradual death in such a short period of time account for the fossil record we observe today? Not only that, to form a fossil, the animal or plant has to be covered quickly. And since we find billions of fossils all over the world today, something that could have killed billions of things rather quickly had to have occurred. Not to mention, we also find many fish and other marine fossils at the tops of today's mountains. So, what in the Bible could account for that? What could cause billions of dead things to be buried in rock layers rapidly laid down by water all over the earth? Well, flip to Genesis chapter 6-9 through nine and you'll read the account of the global flood in Noah's day. Essentially what happened is that men were so corrupt and violent that God selected a righteous man, Noah, and his family to build a huge ark and get in it along with a pair of each land animal kind. And then God caused a worldwide flood. The water gushed up from the ground and water fell from the sky. The earth was totally covered with water and all land-dwelling, air-breathing creatures outside the ark were killed. All of them. It was a massive and destructive event. After more than a year, the waters had subsided enough that Noah and his family and the animals could get off the ark. Now, what would a worldwide flood do to the earth? Well, far too many things to discuss here, but it would have definitely totally changed the earth's terrain. It would have tossed things all around and it would have destroyed billions of plants and animals, burying them all over the earth. So based on the biblical worldview, we know that God created everything and it was perfect. But because of man's rebellion, people became corrupt and all kinds of things began to suffer and die. Because of man's continual violence and corruption, God destroyed all people and all other land-dwelling, air-breathing creatures in the world, save Noah, his family, and representatives of all land-dwelling, air-breathing animal kinds, with a global, catastrophic deluge. The fossil record that we observe today makes perfect sense within the biblical worldview. Now I could go on and on, but enough said. Wow, that was great. Boy, did you enjoy that? I sure did enjoy that. And I hope you learned some things. Did you hear what the gentleman from Answers in Genesis said about fossils? The one thing that fossils actually proved to us is that there was a worldwide flood. And they found fossils of fish on some of the highest mountains in the world. How could a fossil of a fish get on the highest mountain in the world? Well, God answers that in his word. He says there was a worldwide flood. Now, we're here back at our headquarters, our VBS headquarters, and we're going to head to the music station. And we have our friends joining us again from Answers in Genesis with some songs to help us um, understand God's word better and understand that we have to be sure we're using the right kind of lenses as we learned about last week. And I sure hope that you will listen and maybe you can even sing along uh, with them. Every house has a builder, a designer and a plan. Every painting has a painter who paints with his own hand It's the same with all creation, it's everywhere you look Our God made heaven and the earth and he tells us in his book It's simple, simple, simple as that God made heaven and the earth, simple as that it's simple, simple, simple as that The Bible says it, that settles it, simple as that Everything has a reason, a purpose and a plan 
God spoke the word and it happened. That's how the world began. In six days God made everything. He made Adam, he made Eve. His fingerprints are everywhere. Just look and you will see. It's simple, simple, simple as that. God made heaven and the earth. Simple as that. It's simple, simple, simple as that. The Bible says it, that settles it, simple as that. It's simple, 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 simple as that. God made heaven and the earth, simple as that. It's simple, 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 simple as that. The Bible says it, that settles it, simple as that. The Bible says it, that settles it, simple as that. It's simple as that. It's simple, 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 simple as that. It all began in a paradise, in a perfect garden was the tree of life. There was a rule they could not break, there was just one fruit they must not taste. Right side up, turned upside down, man chose sin, God cursed the ground. Then the Son of God came down, in the cross our hope is found. It all began with a big fat lie, if you eat the forbidden fruit you will not die. They thought one taste would make them wise, but they lost their home in paradise. Right side up, turned upside down, man chose sin, God cursed the ground. Then the Son of God came down, in the cross our hope is found. Sin brought sorrow, death, and shame, God's perfect earth was not the same. Thorns and poison, ivy grew, earthquakes shook, and hurricanes blew. All right, boy, I sh sure hope you enjoyed that. And, you know, the thing I love about godly music is godly music teaches us more about God, and it helps to strengthen our faith. So I sure hope that you enjoyed that. Well, we're back here again at our mission headquarters. And now we are going to be heading to another station. One of my favorite stations, we're heading to Mission Central, where we're going to learn more about missionaries and those who have wanted to teach people about God. Because that really is our ultimate goal. Not just to learn about creation, but to realize there are people who need to know about God. That's the reason why we're doing all of this. So that they can learn the truth and not be deceived and learn about God. Okay, I I hope you're listening. Hello boys and girls. I'm so glad that you decided to join us again today. For our missionary lesson, we're going to continue with the lesson that we started last week. Now I have a few questions to see. Who was listening last week during the lesson? Do you remember the name of the little boy in our story? It's David! I hope that you remember that and that you got that right. And David grew up in a village in Scotland. He worked at a factory. What kind of factory did he work, work at? 
It was a cotton factory. Did you get that one right? I sure hope so. He worked at a cotton factory even when he was very young. Because remember, his parents weren't very rich at all. They were very poor. So they worked and he, and he as a boy even worked to help his family. Now when David was 12 years old, he realized that he was a sinner and that he needed to trust Jesus to save him. Did he do it right then? No, he didn't. He waited. He thought he would wait. And that is not a good thing to do. If you know that you need to trust Jesus as your savior, today is the day to trust him. Don't wait like David did. When David was a little older, he realized he should not wait and could not wait any longer. And he trusted Jesus and became a Christian. He became a new person. God worked on his life and God had a special plan for David's life. Today, we get to learn about what that special plan is. As David was a new Christian and God began working on his heart, David began to feel a burden for people around the world who had never heard of Jesus before. And David, he heard especially of the people in China and he thought, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to China to be a missionary. He began working to become a doctor and to learn about medicine so that he could help people as he told them about Jesus. And do you know what happened? Slam! The door shut on China. David learned that he would not be able to go to China. You see, there was a war there and he would not be able to get in as a missionary. I wonder if he thought, what am I supposed to do now? But do you know what? God had a plan and he shut that door on China because he had somewhere else that he wanted David to go. Well, David went to a lecture. A lecture is kind of like when you go to listen to someone speak in class maybe when you're in school and your teacher's teaching you things and he went to this lecture by a missionary to Africa and his name was Robert Moffat and he listened to Robert Moffat speak about Africa and about how the people there needed Jesus and how they needed missionaries to go and he heard Robert Moffat say that some mornings he could look out and he could see from where he was the smoke coming up from a thousand villages where people had never yet heard of Jesus Christ. Oh, they needed missionaries to give their lives and to come work in Africa. And David felt burdened in his heart and God called David to go to Africa. Well, David soon set out for Africa to become a missionary there. And he went down there and oh, he loved to explore. Remember that from when he was a little boy? And he loved to travel and to, to see different things and to learn different things. And Africa sure was different than his home. The people there had different customs. They had a different language and he had to work hard to learn a language so that he could tell the people there about Jesus. He was able to begin getting settled in. You see, they didn't speak English. He had to learn a whole new language. He had to learn all about the people. Now in Africa, there are people all over and they have many different languages and many different customs and cultures and David began with learning just one of those languages so he could tell those people about Jesus. And he taught the people and he helped them. And remember, he had had medical training so he could help them with their sicknesses. And you know, the people there, they loved David because they could see that he truly cared for them. Well, one day, David was in a village that was being terrorized by a wild animal. Do you know what wild animal this was? It was a lion. And it wasn't just one lion. There were many lions. And they would come into this village and they would take the villagers' animals. They would take their sheep and their cows and they would attack them even in broad daylight. And the villagers were terrified by these lions that were coming in. Well, David did some thinking. 
and he knew if we kill just one of those lions, then the rest of them will leave this village alone. So David gathered some people together to go out to hunt and to kill one of these lions. Can you imagine what that would be like? And as they got ready and they went out and they began searching for the lions, David spotted one. He saw one and he thought, that's the one we need to get. And he raised his gun and he shot that lion. And do you know what? The lion didn't die right away. He hit that lion, but a lion is a big animal. And do you know what it did? It made that lion mad and he began charging and he attacked David and bit him in his shoulder and his arm. He was being attacked by a lion. Oh, I sure hope that David survives. Well, there were villagers around and I'm sure that they were coming to help David and the lion began to move around and try to attack other people. And then those bullets that had landed in the lion killed him and he died. And David was still alive. He had survived this attack by the lion. Oh, but his arm was hurt terribly. It would take a long time to heal from that. It had crushed his arm. Well, David, he went back to visit Robert Moffat in his village. Remember Robert Moffat, the one who had told David about the need for missionaries in Africa? Well, he went to the village where Robert Moffat was while his arm was getting better. And his arm, while they were able to do some things to help it, it never completely healed right. And so for the rest of his life, he had that reminder about that lion attack. But do you know what? It also would be a reminder that God had protected him in a very dangerous situation. Well, as David was recovering near the Moffat family, he began to spend a little bit more time with Robert Moffat's daughter. And it wasn't too long before they fell in love and they decided to get married. David had thought maybe that he would never get married and that he would always just be in Africa by himself. But he married Robert Moffat's daughter and her name was Mary. So David and Mary were now married and they could work together. David began thinking about a plan for the future. What would he do in Africa? He had already spent several years there working and telling people about Jesus. But there were so many people who needed to hear. And David saw all the evils in the world around him. And he began thinking, if I can push farther into Africa where no white man has ever gone before, we can create a road, a road that other people can follow. God's highway, a missionary trail where people can come through after us and people can help tell us, tell the other people here about Jesus. Well, I sure am glad that God protected David during that lion attack. Clearly, God still has a plan for David's life and David is beginning to think about pushing farther and exploring more into Africa. So next week, make sure that you come back so we can hear as David travels farther into the dangerous interior of Africa. All right, that was a great story there. Thank you so much. Now it's time to head back to the VBS headquarters and we're going to be heading to the transformation station. What do we do at the transformation station? Well, the Bible teaches that we have to transform our mind. And the only way that we can transform our mind is through the Word of God. So let's head to our memory verse here. And I believe we have a special visitor today. Oh, hello there boys and girls. Oh yes, we've got a special visitor. I am so excited about the memory verse. Oh yes, are you going to help us with the memory verse today? Yes, I sure am. Oh, that's great. Wait a minute, I've got a question first. Well, what, what question do you have? I see you've got something on your shirt there. Yeah, that, that's my microphone so that the boys and girls can hear me. Uh, what are you doing? 
Where's my microphone? Well, you don't need a microphone. Well, that kind of kills the trick. Well, yeah, okay, we're not going to talk about that. Okay, all right, here we go. Can you help us say the Bible verse? I sure can. All right, here we go. Ready? Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Hebrews 11.3. Oh, that was good. But you know, we've got to memorize God's Word. Put it in our heart so that we can say it from memory. So now I've done something. I've made some of the words disappear. Do you see that there? Do you see that? What did you do that for? Well, we've got to learn the Bible so that we can say God's Word the right way. Oh, okay, I'll try it. All right, I think you can do it. Ready? Okay, I'm going to let you say it this time. Okay, here you go. Go ahead. Through food, we understand that the wonderfulness of food makes us... Oh, wait a minute. That's, that's not the Bible verse. What are you doing? I'm just hungry. Sorry. Okay, let's try to say it right. Boys and girls, can you please help him out here? Let's try that again. Ready? Here we go. Through... Ah, oh, faith. Yeah, that's right. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word. Oh, you got it. Word of God. So that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Hebrews 11.3. Oh, they did a pretty good job. You did a pretty good job. Sorry you're hungry. Let's see if you can say it now. Okay, are you ready? Where'd the words go? Well, I... I made some of them disappear so that we can try to memorize God's Word. Oh, okay, I can do this. All right, ready? Here you go. Go ahead. Through fudge, we understand that the women were full. No, 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 don't say that. No, that's, that's not it. All right, boys and girls, come on. We got to help him out here. Let's try it again. Ready? Here we go. Through, oh, that's it. Faith, we understand that the Worlds were framed by the, hmm, help him out kids, what is it? Word of God. Oh, you got it. So that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Hebrews 11.3. Okay, good. Now then, we're going to make it a little bit harder because we want to be sure that we have God's Word hidden in our heart. Where'd the words go? Well, we're going to try to memorize it. We can do it. Okay, are you ready? Here we go. All right. Taco Fridays were yummy. Oh, no, no, <clears throat> that's not it. Taco Fridays. Where did you get that crazy thing from? All right, boys and girls, we're going to have to help him again. Here we go. Ready? Through faith, oh, you got it. We understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen, you got it, were not made of uh, things which do apples. No, 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 up here. Hebrews. Uh, 11.3. You got it. Wow, you did a good job saying that verse there. I want you to tell the boys and girls bye, because now it's time for the Bible story. You're going to need to go sit in your seat. Okay, bye-bye, boys and girls. All right, now then, it's time for us to go to our last station. And we're going to go to my favorite time. You know what favorite, my favorite time is? That is... Bible Adventure Time. I guess maybe I've seen all said all these stations are my favorite because I really enjoy them so much. And we've got a verse that's going to lead into today's Bible lesson. And I want you to pay close attention here. We find it in the book of 2 Peter and chapter 3. And we're going to read several verses uh, with verses 1 through 6. Because God says something very special about what's going to happen in the last days. Notice what God says here. He says, Knowing this, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts. So they're scoffers. They're making fun of God's word. They're saying things couldn't have happened like they said. And why are they doing that? Because they want to live their life their way. That's what it means, walking after their own lust. And what are they going to be saying? The Bible says, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? That's talking about when Jesus comes back from heaven. And they say, for since the fathers fell asleep, that meant since um, those people that have told us these things have passed away, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. 
So they're just they're being critical of the Bible, and they're saying Jesus is not really going to come back. Um, they've been saying for thousands of years that he's going to come back from heaven, and he hasn't come back yet. And then the Bible says that for this they willingly are ignorant of that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. You know, there is evidence all around this world that God actually created this world. And there's evidence that there was a worldwide flood. But the Bible says that they are willingly ignorant. You know what that means? It means dumb on purpose. And they are ignoring all of this evidence because they want to live life their way. They don't want to acknowledge that God created everything because then they'll have to answer to God. And what else does the Bible say? It says, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. Now, the Bible talks about there being a worldwide flood. Why did God have to send a worldwide flood. Well, last week we learned about creation and how God created everything in six days. And on the seventh day, the Bible says that he, that he rested. That doesn't mean that he was sleepy and went and took a nap. It just means that he was done. And when God created everything, it was perfect. Uh, the animals were perfect and uh, the Garden of Eden where Adam and Eve lived was perfect. And they had all these things that they could have except they had one rule God had given them. And that rule was that they could not eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That was their one rule. Now, how would you like to have life with one rule? But the Bible says that the devil came along in the form of a serpent, and he tricked them. You know, instead of Adam and Eve thinking about all the wonderful things they could have, the devil tricked them into thinking of the one thing that they couldn't have. And as they thought about it, they decided that they wanted to be like God, like the devil said that they would be like God. He's trying to trick them, knowing what good and evil is. So they took a bite of that fruit, and when they did, they had sinned. And God had to remove them, could no longer let them live in the Garden of Eden, because now they've sinned. It wouldn't be perfect anymore. And now, for... Um, over a thousand years, uh, people have lived on the earth. Adam and Eve had children, and their children had children, and the world has filled up. And something interesting happened back then, uh, before the flood. The Bible says that people lived to be hundreds of years old, over five, six, seven, eight hundred years. And God saw that as people lived older, they had more opportunity to do wrong, unfortunately. And they started to sin. And as a result of their sin, they had become so wicked that the Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 6 that every imagination of their heart was only evil continually. The word evil means hurtful. All they were thinking about was hurtful things. And because of that, God was going to have to punish the world. He was going to have to send a flood. But the Bible does tell us there was one man named Noah. And Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, the Bible says. And God was going to allow Noah to, um, he told Noah that he was going to need to build an ark to, um, to be saved from this flood. Now think about this, what was the flood? It was God's judgment. So to be saved from God's judgment, Noah had to build an ark. And Noah and his family, and he had uh, his wife and three sons and their wives, and they started working on this ark. And they worked on it many, many years. And while Noah was working on this ark, he told other people, um, about God's coming judgment and that the only way that they could be saved is by getting on that ark with them. But I would imagine that many people probably laughed at Noah. They said, Noah, what are you doing? What's that silly thing you're building there in your yard? An ark? Why are you building an ark? Rain? What's rain? You know, we think that they uh, didn't rain at this time. Uh, based on some of the things that the Bible tells us. We don't know that for sure, but we believe that they had never seen rain before and that God had used different methods to um, water the plants and everything because the world, we believe, was much different before the flood. And so they were thinking, what is this rain you're talking about? We've never seen this rain and um, we don't believe you. And they just, they laughed and made fun of Noah. But Noah and his family were working on this ark. And what's one of the reasons they're doing this? To escape God's judgment. You know, throughout this time, 
time they were commanded by God to um, make sacrifices and and this sacrifice was to remind them of one day the sacrifice God would send Jesus who would be the Lamb of God the Bible tells us to pay the price for their sin and right now they're building this ark so that they can escape God's judgment and after they finished the ark uh, God brought the animals to Noah uh, two by two some animals they brought the clean animals they brought seven of on the ark um, probably so that they could make sacrifices to God to remind them um, that they they need a uh, an atonement for their sins and they brought all the animals on the ark and I can almost imagine as Noah uh, brought all the animals on and the Bible says that God closed the door to the ark. And I want you to think about this boys and girls. When God closes a door, no man can open it. And God, right now, God's giving people the door is open for people to be saved and to trust Jesus as their Savior. And we have a chance today to trust Jesus as our Savior. But one day we'll have our last chance. And as uh, just before, I can only I can almost imagine as just before that door closed, maybe Noah came out and said, Okay, here's your chance. This is your last chance to get on the ark and be saved from God's judgment. And many people probably laughed and made fun of Noah. And then the Bible says that God God closed the door. And maybe there were even people out there uh, uh, making fun and laughing at Noah until then they finally they heard that sound. They heard the thunder striking. And they could hear something coming they had never heard before. They could hear that rain coming. And maybe some people were out there, um, maybe they were around the campfire in their town as they started to feel that rainfall. And then the water started to get higher. Start came up to their knees, to their waist. And then they, um, they, they realized, hey, Noah was right. There, there is a flood coming. God is going to judge the earth. And maybe they started to head to the ark and they, then they started to beg, Noah, Noah, we believe you now, Noah. Noah, let us on the ark. But I can almost imagine how Noah may have cried out and said, You're too late. You're too late. You had your chance to get on the ark, but you didn't believe. And now it's too late. God has closed the door. And the rain came down harder and harder. And the floodwaters grew. And those people who chose not to believe God's man, Noah, who was trying to tell them what God had said, the Bible says that they perished. They died. All of them. And all the air-breathing animals that weren't on the ark, they died as well. And the flood came. And the Bible says that the waters were above the mountains. And Noah was on this ark for many months. And you can read it about it in, in, the, in the book of Genesis, chapters 6, 7, and 8, about this, this uh, event that happened. And eventually, the Bible says that the waters uh, started to come off of the land, and the uh, ark landed there on, on Mount Ararat, and the animals were released, and Noah got off the ark. And Noah did another sacrifice. A, he performed another sacrifice as thankfulness to God, and to realize that the only way for us to be saved is by trusting in God and that we have to have a sacrifice made for our sin and God sent a rainbow as a sign to Noah that there would be no more floods to, or complete worldwide floods to destroy the world now there are some floods today but not a worldwide flood God would not destroy the whole world again now what can we learn from this story well you know the Bible says that one day Jesus is going to come back from heaven those Bible verses that we read earlier in the book of 2 Peter, they talk about Jesus coming back. And just like in Noah's day, Noah preached, there's a flood coming. God's judgment is coming on this earth. You need to get on the ark and be saved. Well, today, do you know what preachers preach? They preach that Jesus is coming. He's going to come back from heaven. And everybody who is a Christian, he's going to take us up to heaven. We call that the rapture. And when Jesus comes back, everybody whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life will get to go up to heaven to live with him forever. And after that time, God is going to judge this world again. It's called the tribulation period. 
and it'll be the worst thing this world has ever gone through. It'll be worse than that flood. And I don't have time to tell you all the things that are going to happen, but it's going to be an awful time for those who are left behind. But God wants you to be in heaven with Him. And everyone who's saved, who has their name written in the Lamb's Book of Life when Jesus comes, will get to go up to live with Him in heaven. Now, how do we get our name written in that Lamb's Book of Life? Well, first we have to realize the Bible says in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're all sinners. We have all done something that displeases God. Sin is anything that we do, say, or think that displeases God. Sin is also not doing what we know we should do. And those sins keep us from going to heaven. Just like you see here on this picture, this little boy, he's, he's uh, cheating off of this girl's test paper, and you can see these other two boys fighting. Well, because of sin, we can't go to heaven. And no matter how small or how big it is, sin separates us from God. And you know, there's a price for our sin. The Bible says in Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death. That word wages means payment. The payment that God accepts for sin is death. That's it. Some people are really confused and they say, well, maybe if I go to church and I give money to church and read my Bible and pray and if I do all these good things, God will forgive me of my sin. God didn't say the wages for sin is being good. We should do those things, but it's not the payment for our sin. The payment for sin is death. Let's read the rest of that verse. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Did you notice what the Bible said um, we, receive, we can receive from God? It's a gift, the gift of eternal life. A gift is something you don't have to work for. You just have to receive it. You know, God wants you to be with Him in heaven one day. Heaven's a beautiful place. Here is an artist's drawing of heaven. Heaven looks probably ten, maybe a hundred times better than that drawing. But still, it looks like a pleasant place, doesn't it? God wants you to be in heaven with Him where there's streets of gold and, and um, there's uh, just a wonderful place. But you know what's not in heaven? There's no sin inside of heaven. Because of my sin and because of your sin, we're not allowed to go there. But the Bible says in Romans 5, 8, But God commendeth His love toward us, and that, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus came to this earth, and He paid our sin debt for us 2,000 years ago on the cross. And just like in our Bible story, we talked about how the ark was what God used to save the people from the flood, um, to save people from His judgment. Today, we have to trust what Jesus did on the cross for us. That's the only way for us to be saved from the eternal judgment of God. That's the only way for us to be saved and live, to live with Him in heaven and not have to die and go to hell, is by trusting what Jesus did on the cross for us. The Bible says in Romans 10, 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You know, God made it as easy as A, B, C for us to go to heaven. What are the A, B, C's of salvation? A, we have to admit that you are a sinner and that you cannot save yourself. We have to tell God we're sorry for our sins and admit that we, there's nothing we can do that can save ourselves um, from our sin. And B, we have to believe that Jesus died, He was buried, and He rose again to pay for your sin. He did that for you when He died on the cross. He had never sinned, so He died for our sin. And then C, you have to call on Jesus in prayer and ask Him to save you. Have you done that before? If you haven't, you can do that right now. We're going to pray in just a minute, but you could quietly right there in your heart tell Jesus you're sorry for your sins, that you believe He died for you on the cross, and ask Him to save you. Let's pray. Father, thank You for this day, and thank You for loving us. And Lord, I do pray for those boys and girls, uh, anyone else who's listening that has never trusted You as their Savior, I pray that right now they will quietly in their heart um, tell You that they are sorry for their sins. And that they do believe you died for their sins on the cross and that they'll call on you and ask you to save them so that they can have a home in heaven. And for those that have been saved, I hope they'll realize that 
that you are coming back one day from heaven. And we need to tell other people how they can be saved so that they can have a home in heaven. Lord, I pray that you'll help us to do that. Help us to please you with all that we do and say. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, you all, truth seekers, you sure did a great job listening today. And if you noticed, down below in the link, there are some activities that your parents can download for you and that you can do those to help you to help reinforce the truth that we learned today about Noah's flood and about creation. Now, don't forget, we'll be back next week, same time on Wednesday at 6 o'clock. And I hope that you will invite some friends to be here and to listen. And wouldn't it be wonderful if you invited the friends in your neighborhood to listen and they trusted Jesus as their Savior? That would be awesome. And they would get to see you in heaven one day because you told them how that they could be saved. All right, remember, we love you here at Mountain View, and we will see you next week. Bye-bye. Praise Him. Praise.